Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Bly Street. I'm Michael Fullylove. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute. It's my pleasure today to be welcoming an old friend of mine, the new Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, Andrew Colvin. The Lowy Institute's job is to deepen the international policy discussion in Australia and give Australia a greater voice abroad. And in doing that, we look at the full arc of Australia's interests and our broader role in the world. And of course, threats to those interests come not only from state actors, but from non-state actors such as transnational criminal and terrorist networks as well. To address this threat, the AFP maintains an international network across 30 odd countries. So when we think about Australians on the front line, it's not only diplomats, soldiers, sailors and airmen we're thinking of, it's also police officers. Last year with the downing of MH17, we saw the AFP again at the forefront of Australia's response deployed to the crash site in eastern Ukraine. And that deployment built on a history of overseas deployments by the AFP, including building policing capacity in the Pacific and restoring order during humanitarian crises. And one of the most famous and successful examples of that was the police-led intervention by Australia, Ramsey, in the Solomon Islands. The AFP also has a crucial role as part of Australia's national security apparatus in addressing terrorism. And in the short period that Andrew has held the job of Commissioner, he's been very seized of the terrorism issue, not least because of the awful events that took place just a few blocks from here at the Lint Cafe. Andrew Colvin has served in the AFP for 25 years in areas including organised crime, money laundering, political, politically motivated crime and terrorism financing. In the early 2000s, when I got to know him, Andrew was central to the AFP's response to terrorism, including the Bali bombings, the Jakarta Marriott bombing and the Australian Embassy bombing. He was Chief of Staff to the former Commissioner Mick Kelty and since 2010 he had been a de Deputy Commissioner working in operations and national security before he was appointed Commissioner. Andrew has also completed a Masters in Public Administration at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to invite Andrew Colvin to give his first major speech as Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police. And uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Michael, for those very kind words and good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's a very full room out there and I think timing is everything in this particular business. Uh, can I firstly acknowledge, uh, Michael, your presence here today and members of the Diplomatic Corps, uh, AFP members, some of my executive colleagues as well as members of the AFP more broadly, thank you for coming along and uh, supporting uh, this speech today. Can I also just acknowledge quickly the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, their elders past and present, and of course the spiritual attachment that they have to this place. It's interesting, Michael, hearing what you said in the introduction. We have known each other for a while now, and I think it's probably eight years ago when you first pitched to what was two commissioners ago now, uh, the idea of a commissioner speaking uh, at the Institute in Bly Street. And, uh, we said it was a good idea then. I don't think we anticipated it might take this long. And as I say, timing is everything. But it's, it is a pleasure to be here. It's, it's wonderful to get my first opportunity to say a few words in this forum. Uh, so as I say, it is a privilege to be here and share some of my insights and my thoughts uh, as I commence in a role that I'm very honoured to be in, very privileged to be in, but also quite humbled to take on. Uh, the AFB has a proud and unique place in the Australian law enforcement landscape. There's no doubt about that. Not only are we the country's youngest police agency, uh, we also enjoy a very unique remit to support national and international policing operations with a mix of diverse legislative frameworks, unique capabilities and a very broad international reach, as Michael has talked about. Much of what we do today is topical. And much of what we do today is controversial. And uh, this puts us at the centre of the media cycle. It puts us at the centre of public consciousness. And I'm sure when I finish speaking today that some of the questions that I will receive will very much put me on the spot on those key issues. Uh, we've faced and met many challenges in that short 35 year history and we're now an integral partner and part of the Australian law enforcement landscape. We have developed robust, intuitive and mutually beneficial relationships across the globe. Uh, and to that end, I have the advantage that I take over as commissioner of an organisation that is respected, successful, valued and in very good shape and I can thank my predecessors for that. But 
In my mind, as an incoming commissioner, as a new commissioner, it's not enough just to lead a police force that can simply do a good job today. Essential to my goals as commissioner is to question how do I ensure that the AFP will be a better placed in five years, 10 years, or even 20 years from now? I think that is a challenge for all modern, resource-constrained leaders, to lead your organisation and to leave it better than the position that you found it in. So today is a little about where we are headed and not just what we do. Uh, I'm often asked an obvious question, what are the AFP's priorities? Unfortunately, I find the answer to not be so obvious and I find it a very difficult question to give a precise answer to. The truth is, from the AFP perspective, our priorities are many. I have a ministerial direction that was updated just last year, which tells me what the expectation of government is for the AFP. As you would expect, and quite rightly, it's extensive and it covers a great deal of responsibility. But equally, when I became commissioner, I said that my term will likely be dominated by national security. And that's no great surprise. It's an obvious result of the environment, the very difficult environment that we are now faced with. But when I became commissioner, just the same, I said, I do not want the AFP to lurch so strongly towards national security that we forget some of our core and traditional policing remits, if you like, transnational and organised crime. And that's a lesson that we've learnt from the past and a lesson that I've certainly lived through. Now, if I wanted to complicate the priority question, I'd answer, uh, I would present a case that places our efforts on organised crime, on cyber, on international capacity building, on transnational crime, on our peace operations that we're a part of around the world, and I'd place them right alongside counterterrorism operations and our protection operations and say that they are all national security. So, in some ways, the question is probably moot. Everything we do now is a priority. It's simply now a matter of how we move between those priorities according to the landscape that we face on any given day. And that, frankly, is the challenge for leaders of any modern policing organisation. So what matters to me is not the priority question, and maybe it's just too difficult for me to give you an accurate definition for, or an accurate answer. But I have a different set of questions in my mind. How do we retain our flexibility, our agility, our capabilities to respond to whatever challenge is next around the corner? What challenges may we face and what skills do we need to meet them? Is the AFP ready to meet them? What is, it the, what is the value that we add to the broader equation? And can we do business smarter? Now, no one can confidently tell me what the next challenge will be, and I welcome anyone who wants to try and do that. Uh, but that's not unique to policing, it's not unique to the public sector. In fact, I would say it's a daunting thought for the CEO of any industry to try and predict what may be around the corner. As I said, my term as Commissioner will likely be dominated by national security, particularly counter-terrorism. But what is the next event that will take terrorism off the front pages? Is it a large cyber attack? Is it significant investment fraud? Is it corruption? Is it a natural disaster or is it a call from a, one of our close neighbours in a cry for help? Uh, Michael's already mentioned this, but had you asked me 12 months ago if I could see a situation where the AFP would deploy teams of unarmed men and women to the heart of an active conflict zone in eastern Ukraine with no notice, no area familiarity, no established links, no partnerships, to, to identify and bring home the remains of Australian victims and to investigate the shooting down of a passenger plane, I'm pretty sure I probably would have told you that even as a hypothetical exercise, that was a bridge too far for me to consider. But we did it, and as Michael said, we did it very well. And I think it's important to note for the record that we are still doing it. We still have officers at the moment in Ukraine and the Netherlands working on what will be a very lengthy and difficult investigation. So importantly, the question in my mind at deploying those officers to eastern Ukraine was not about how many police I needed, but it was about the right police, with the right skills, the right capabilities, and the right support. Now that gets me to my key theme for today. Too often, and very often, policing is judged by the numbers. Not just the numbers that make up our crime statistics or our key performance indicators, but often the number of personnel, the number of uniformed officers available. How many sworn police does an agency have? These are our capacities. How many police do I need? And they're so often prioritised over our cap capabilities. What skills 
what tools, what capabilities do I need the police I have to actually have? Now, there's no question both are important, and I'm constantly reminded that no police commissioner, certainly in this country, will ever say they've got enough resources to do anything. We're always going to ask for more. I think that's in our breeding. Uh, but both are important, but it's our capabilities that we need to consider more deeply. Now, for over 35 years, the AFP has succeeded on the abilities and the adaptability of our members and the support and the sharing and the success we've had in our partnerships. In order for the next 35 years to have that same sense of purpose and direction, the AFP needs to understand, as well as we possibly can, what that future state might look like. Now, today's demands on national law enforcement have changed just a little since 1979 when the AFP was established. And in, the AFP in particular has adapted to those changes over those 35 years, largely from within our existing frameworks and settings. For most of that 35 years, the pace of change was manageable. We could adapt and we could keep up. But the nature of the threats facing the Australian community today have become more sophisticated, they've become far more diverse, and the pace of change, as we all know, is exponential. So the gap is widening. Likewise, our communities are changing. Social cohesion is increasingly linked more to technology than it is to personal interaction. High density neighbourhoods with like-minded families and individuals where they live, work and play within a much more confined space is becoming the norm. And this presents a different set of social values and different challenges for police. So if our lifestyles are not traditional, then why should our policing be traditional? To me, it's no longer good enough for us to adapt our understanding of the environment and the capabilities we need based solely on the lessons that we have learnt from our last experience. We must now constantly review and refresh our thinking of what capabilities our police need and what skills are important to meet that emerging environment. We must preempt these challenges to the best extent we can, and if we don't, we run the risk of stagnating in our development and we run the risk of consigning our organisations to be merely responsive rather than intuitive. So, in order to deliver what a future capable AFP may look like, we need to understand what the future landscape might look like. And for that reason, I've commissioned Deputy Commissioner Graham Ashton, the AFP's newly appointed Deputy Commissioner for Capability, to develop an AFP futures paper. It's a paper that will be owned by the AFP that will be delivered with the support of our key stakeholders and our key partners. This futures paper will refresh our current thinking. It will, build, it will build a capability roadmap for understanding our future demands and provide a sense of long-term direction of purpose to the AFP and our members. And it will be the hook, importantly for me, by which all of our future planning, both strategic and operational, will hang on. The futures paper will develop along three key themes. The look at protecting Australians, a core responsibility for, Austra for the Australian Federal Police, looking at those prevention, disruption and community engagement efforts. It'll look at protecting Australia's interests, understanding where policing fits within that broader policy space, um, adding government value and introducing concepts such as police-led diplomacy, which I'll say more about in a minute. And finally, and something that is deeply important to me as Commissioner, is it will look at the health of the AFP. So it will give us a clarity of mission. It will give us safety and sustainability of our business models and our people. And in the current environment, I can't uh, impress enough about the safety of our people. But it will also say what the AFP member needs to look like in the future. We plan to challenge the paradigms of traditional policing methods, explore opportunities to help shape the environment we operate in, and encourage unique combinations of specific skills, capabilities and systems that will support a far more effective AFP. So working with a key stakeholder group, the paper should identify, er identify areas and themes for consideration that otherwise we may not have considered. The paper will ask direct questions about the role and functions of the AFP and the policy settings that currently shape us as an organisation. It will shape our investment decisions, it should shape our workforce plan, our capability plans well into the future. It will not be focused specifically on any crime or any crime type, but it will look at generic capabilities that we need to do the job. In many ways, it will be crime neutral, if that's uh, how we'd like to see it. It will be the first step in understanding what the AFP of the future may look like and will better inform the expectations placed upon the AFP in responding to that future environment. Importantly, 
It will inform what we should measure, how we should measure it, to ensure that our capabilities are best placed to detect, prevent and disrupt criminal activity. So let us consider for a moment two of those potential capabilities that will be looked at as we move forward. On the one hand, there are those core, key, traditional policing capabilities, those that the public would most likely understand and appreciate in a policing organisation, the skills of our officers and the tools that we use. I'll talk about that in a minute. On the other hand, we should consider further that unique international remit, that role that is so important to the AFP. How should we develop and deploy this very scarce commodity into the future? The common view when you align policing with capabilities is to trend towards and gravitate towards things rather than capabilities. Now, don't get me wrong, the AFP, like all our police cousins, love things. We love our toys. And they're an important part of modern uh, policing. And again, don't get me wrong, they will always be uh, an important part of the focus of the AFP to have the most modern and technically advanced tools to do the job. But in my view, it will be the softer skills of our officers as we move forward that will actually define who we are as an organisation. To the modern and future police officer, capability extends beyond the computer that they track or follow information with, or the bear cat that you might see on the streets um, dominating some in inhospitable environment. We have to become a developed package of elements that ensures the most effective means of supporting our police. Ensuring this effective force requires ensuring that our core policing capabilities, the knowledge, the skills, the technology, the systems that we all use, are there to support the officer's objectives. And to do that, the traditional skills of sworn police officers need, in my view, to be supplemented by a nuanced and professional set of tailored skills to the environment that we face. What we need our police forces to look like in the future is highly unlikely to be what they look like now. So while identifying specialised capability as a key to ensuring an effective future does not in any way diminish the vital role of a sworn police officer, it acknowledges that the sworn police officer should be viewed as the end user of skills and technologies adapted for a very specific purpose. We shouldn't be merely a carbon copy of what we were in the 70s, 80s or even five or seven years ago. Police agencies must develop and arm their officers with more than a gun, a baton, to be effective into the future. Now, the future AFP investigative team, if I focus on that for a minute, may well only contain a few investigators who drive the criminal proof elements that we're taught all about when we join the police force. I expect that it will actually contain an expertise mix where the technical capabilities and skills are provided by specialists. Cyber, technical, accountants, lawyers, could even be psychologists and the like. A harmony of police expertise and professional know-how uh, that in many ways will see the police officer become the captain who marshals the knowledge and expertise of those best placed to understand the methods and techniques used by modern criminals. But not only that, those that are best placed to understand the vulnerabilities that have been exploited and what we must do to address them. Now sure, you say these capabilities currently exist within most modern police forces, particularly uh, international police forces. But the move to a truly integrated workforce will lead to a more effective use of the resources that we have available. We can no longer afford to view our workforces as a distinction between sworn and unsworn. It must be about our capabilities. It must be about our outcomes. It must be about the best way for it to be delivered. Police officers and the execution of police powers will always be central to what we do. We can't do what we do without that. But from an AFP perspective at least, it can often only be one part of the equation. Now, an obvious example that I'm keen to explore, and this will be no surprise to most, is in technology and our understanding of the cyber environment. Uh, digital natives now dominate the emerging workforce. Not only do they understand the digital environment, they are intuitive enough to understand how it is manipulated, where the vulnerabilities are, how it is exploited, and what we have to do to adapt. So they bridge the gap between the current environment and the skills of a traditional police officer. Uh, it's not a learned skill. I can teach my police about the cyber environment, but I'm only ever teaching them. It's not intuitive. To a digital native coming through the workforce now, it's natural and they're not intimidated <coughs> by it. So if that's the human capability piece, and if the skills of our members, be they sworn or unsworn, 
are our bread and butter, then it's the international linkages that, the AF that is the AFP's competitive advantage. That's our value add that I mentioned earlier. Of course, one area of AFP operations that was largely unpredictable 35 years ago that has had to rapidly develop both in its capacity and its capability is the reach and responsibility of our international network. A target destination for transnational crime as Australia, due in part to our wealthy status, our very early use and early adoption of technology, and a relatively cashed up society, means that Australia's efforts in the region and globally have continued to be pivotal to the success of the AFP and policing operations more broadly. The AFP operates one of the world's largest and most diverse law enforcement international networks. Regional instability, techn technological advances, innovative criminal syndicates, and a widening of the terrorist networks have combined with a globalised world to see the AFP's international footprint expand, to see it become more sophisticated and far more reliant on our international relationships than ever before. The AFP has an international reach that includes almost 100 liaison officers in 29 countries around the world and an international deployment group, more regionally based, that sees an additional 300 officers based offshore at any one time. Now, that's a large portion of my workforce. For many years now, we have built these efforts around a strategy of taking the fight against crime offshore, often to the very places it originates or to the places that it transits through. And it's easy to explain these efforts as targeting the criminal enterprise at its origin, a successful method for tackling uh, combating crime. But a broader view of efforts would see the AFP target crime in a much more holistic manner, attacking the criminal environment. In other words, target hardening those environments that may support these criminal enterprises. Now, we are responsible for significant capacity development projects. And surprising to many, we are one of Australia's largest deliverers of foreign aid. On the surface, that's an odd role for a law enforcement agency uh, to actually undertake. But in reality, it builds perfectly on the strategy to strengthen Australia from crime by helping our neighbours develop their own capabilities, their own safety and their own security. The bilateral and multilateral sharing of information, evidence, technology and capabilities through our international presence assists us to deliver on our promise of leading the disruption and prosecution efforts. An interesting fact is of the 2,000 odd AFP investigations that we have in our national and international arena at the moment, uh, over 60% of those have a direct link or association with international law enforcement or transnational crime. The AFP is an equal share partner in international law enforcement efforts and we're responsible for, for developing and through our network, delivering information, evidence, technology and capabilities that are world leading. It has worked and we will keep doing it. But where should we develop this capability and how should it evolve? And how can we derive the maximum benefit from the work that we have done? Well, this is an answer that the future papers will need to consider and respond to. But there are simple things that we can start to consider in anticipation. Police-led diplomacy is a concept that utilises law enforcement links more broadly to build upon and find common bilateral and multilateral ground and diplomatic ground where more traditional exchanges often present barriers. What country doesn't want to cooperate on terrorism? What country doesn't want to cooperate on organised crime, on child sex tourism, on cyber crime and the like? The work of the AFP and the Indonesian National Police in the years after the Bali bombings of 2002 was, and this is in the eyes of many analysts, not in the eyes of the AFP, or certainly not only in the eyes of the AFP, it was a high point in the broader bilateral relationship between our two countries. Now, underscoring these efforts, that police-led diplomacy, the building of those broader and deeper relationships, will ultimately work to prevent a criminal's ability to hide in the gaps created between jurisdictions. These relationships have to deliver, though, more than simply good exchanges of intelligence. They must evolve behind, beyond strong international cooperation, even beyond the strong operational collaboration that we are currently seeing. If we're to build upon this base that we have and evolve our international capabilities along the lines of police-led diplomacy, then we will open up the opportunity to truly make a difference on the impact of crime on Australia by harmonising the laws, 
by working with our partners on better policy, uh, by improving legislation, by improving rule of law frameworks, and a greater understanding of both the criminal cycle and the root causes of crime. Now, Australia's efforts in the Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, more recently Papua New Guinea, have been challenging. At times, they've been frustrating. But they've ultimately led to better relationships between our countries, better law and governance arrangements in those countries, places where health, education and investment initiatives can thrive, but from where we see less impact of crime emanating onto Australia. Of course, this isn't just the remit of the AFP. It involves a whole of government approach, and that is something I can say that, the, that Australia is very good at. But we have the relationships and we have the history to make it a possibility. The more we do this, the more the net will tighten, and the less reach transnational crime will have on Australia. So as Commissioner, I cannot hope to achieve this vision unless we continue, of course, to perform the tasks expected of us today to an exceptionally high standard. Any police force must be judged by its performance in the here and now. That's only right and it's proper. And we'll continue to do this, but we'll do so with an eye towards the future. I do not want us to stagnate, nor do I want the AFP to be satisfied simply with the status quo. To do so would only limit our ability to continue to perform in the future. We have a unique opportunity to show leadership, nationally and internationally. Far from being an agency with the responsibility to enforce and implement the laws and policies that somebody else determines, I envisage an AFP actively engaged in influencing our environment and our future. To do so, we must first shift the emphasis away simply from capacities and focus equally, if not more, on capabilities. A futures paper for the AFP will be the first step in that process. So the AFP, I hope, has a bright future. I know it has a bright future. We are, and we will be even more so in the future, one of the most exciting and rewarding employers across any industry. With employees who are valued, skilled, diverse, and who are very focused on the national interest and the national priorities. It will be challenging, it will be ambitious, and it will be complex. But that, I suggest, is what we should expect of all of our national agencies, of government and its leaders. Uh, Michael, before I finish, if you'll indulge me for a further few minutes, uh, I'm sure that there is a great desire to hear me speak about the Bali Nine. Uh, it's not my, it was never my intention to speak about that here today, but I recognise that this will be expected given current events. So if I can say a few words. I firstly like to say that I understand that this is an extremely difficult time for the family, friends and for Mr Chan and Mr Sukumaran. You would not be human if you did not feel for their situation that they are in. For many months, the AFP has been doing what it can to support the whole of government diplomatic efforts. And today, I would like to again add our voice to the Australian government's plea for mercy. It's our hope that the Indonesian government will reconsider its decision to proceed with the executions. As the Foreign Minister has previously said, their rehabilitation is a great testament to the success, to the success of the Indonesian rehabilitation programs in prison. I'd also like to say that I understand that the Australian public's right to better understand the AFP's role and work back in 2005 during this Bali 9 investigation is to be expected. I'm prepared to say that much of the information that has been circulating in recent weeks doesn't accurately reflect our role, it doesn't accurately reflect the work that we did in 2005, and unfortunately it ignores the findings of several reviews, judicial hearings that have since scrutinised the AFP's actions. The AFP has at all times and will always be transparent and accountable for our actions. And it is no different in this particular matter. So at the right time, I will discuss this in a lot more detail and I'll take the questions that the public obviously wish to ask. But while the government efforts are continuing to help Mr Chan and Mr Sukumaran, uh, now is not the right time for me to go into that in great detail. So with that, Michael, uh, I'll close. Thank you very much again for the opportunities to speak. I'm sure that there'll be some questions, uh, and I'm happy to take whatever questions there may be. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've heard a very impressive speech from the Commissioner.
very broad ranging, touching on some of the organisational challenges that he faces as a new commissioner, talking about police-led diplomacy uh, and addressing the question of the Bali Nine and the circumstances of Mr Chan, Mr Sukumar. Uh, we have, the Commissioner has kindly agreed to take your questions. We have about 20, 25 minutes. Just before I go to the first question from the audience, I might take the Chairman's prerogative, uh, Andrew, and ask you about an issue you didn't talk about in depth, and that is terrorism. Yes. Um, we, as a country, uh, especially where we are just down the road from Martin Place, we feel the, the anxiety that comes from these kinds of attacks on our country. Um, but we're also anxious to make sure that uh, our response doesn't do violence to the values that we cherish as a democracy. So can I ask you, as a first question, as a new commissioner, looking at this, how do you strike, how do you think we as a country are going at striking this balance between security on the one hand and liberty on the other? Yeah, thanks, Michael. And look, it's a, it's a good question and it's something that's dominated the six months uh, since I've been interim and then, and then commissioner. Obviously, uh, four days after, after the previous commissioner left, I stood with the uh, Prime Minister and the then, the then Director General of uh, ASIO and we raised the national threat level to high. Uh, we did that because uh, we felt that the information that we had available to us needed to be relayed to the public and we needed the public to be taken into our confidences in terms of what our expectations were. What we were very clear at the time was to try and get the message out there that we didn't want people to overreact. We wanted people to go about their normal business, but we wanted them to be aware so that they could assist police and assist law enforcement. And thankfully, uh, I can say that that has largely, from our perspective, worked. We are getting very good cooperation from the community. Now, events of December last year, I think, attacked and hit <coughs> deeply at the heart and the core of who Australians are. Um, and one of the things that I found remarkable was the response of Sydney uh, and the response of the Australian community more broadly after those events. I mean, what we saw uh, develop in Martin Place spontaneously with the flowers was something nobody had predicted. In fact, we were concerned that there could be a, a, a negative reaction. And I think that gets to the core of who Australians are and the way we perceive these threats, the way we want to deal with it. Very little is going to allow anybody to shake the fabric of who we are. And having just returned from the US, I can say that that was commented upon incredibly favourably by a lot of countries, the way Australia reacted. Now, are we, are we finding the right balance? That's, that's difficult. The first job of government, as the Prime Minister has said many times, is to protect Australians. Uh, the first job of a police force, the first, first job of a police commissioner, is to protect Australians. And sometimes, as you'll see, that that will mean that we will act a lot earlier rather than waiting. I, I think the threat has changed and morphed in this country, so much so that agencies have had to change the way they react. There's nothing that I want to do, either as police commissioner, nor as Andrew Colvin, member of this society, that wants to pick away at the fabrics of who we are. Making the decisions that we had to make around putting more armed security around Parliament House, the centre of democracy in this country, was a difficult decision and not one we took lightly. But it's the balance that we have to find between protecting individuals and making sure that those personal freedoms and liberties are also protected. Uh, in answer to your direct question, how do I think we're going? I think we need to keep watching it. I think we need to be very careful, but I think we're doing it right. We have about 20 minutes left. I'm going to take questions as I see people put their hands up. Can I ask you to wait till a microphone comes? Can I ask you, please, in the interest of fitting in as many questions as we can to ask a question, please don't make a statement, because I'll rule that out of order. We're looking for questions to the Commissioner. This is the first gentleman I saw in the red tie. Uh, thank you. Michael Ahrens, uh, Transparency International. Could I compliment you on taking the lead in the new network for anti-corruption that you've, uh, you're heading up in Canberra uh, with the cooperation of, uh, what, I think eight other agencies? Yes. And uh, in particular, the new one, which is the linkage with, the, uh, with Austrac. Yes. Do you see that as a very growing linkage, uh, to an effective one for uh, money laundering, anti-money laundering in this, uh, in your under your priorities, yeah. many, many priorities, yeah. I would appreciate. Look, thank you. And uh, so the, the team you're talking about is our Fraud and Anti-Corruption Centre, which we stood up a few years ago. And, and to be quite honest and frank, we stood it up because there were criticisms of the organisation about whether we had the balance right in terms of foreign bribery matters, corruption investigations. 
Uh, we did that in partnership, as you say, with eight other agencies, and Austrac is a key partner for us. Money laundering and flows of cash, illicit cash in this country, are quite large. Uh, money laundering has become an important part of what we do. I think there's a, there's a perception often that money is often drug money. Um, it's not. There's money uh, generated that comes from a whole range of crimes, some of which are the types of things that Transparency International are very focused on around bribery, corruption. So that is a key part of the work for us. And the reason why I was very specific in what I said in my speech is they are, that, that's important work for the AFP. It's work that the Australian community expects of us. Uh, it would be a shame if I was able to do nothing else but terrorism. Now, that's a priority and, and I can never, ever um, negate that priority away because I have to protect individuals first and foremost. But I will work hard to make sure that we don't lose the focus on those areas like our fraud and anti-corruption work. In fact, I, I see it as the future. I see it um, as a, um, a, a, a growing and emerging problem for Australian society. Next gentleman I saw here was in the corner. Uh, Carlos Salmer from Australian Associated Press. Uh, Commissioner, it's been widely reported that the AFP provided information to the Indonesian authorities that led to the arrest of the Bali Nine. Uh, put simply, does the AFP have blood on its hands? And secondly, what are, do you have any personal misgivings or regrets about the way things were handled? Okay. Um, put simply, do we have blood on our hands? No. Uh, put simply, was this part of a conspiracy uh, for greater cooperation that I've seen written about? No. Uh, and I find those comments misinformed and misguided. Uh, as I said, though, now's not the time for us to go into a, a long defence or an explanation of our role. There is nothing I would say today, even if I did, that has not been put on the record in courts in Australia, in the federal court when we were challenged about our role, uh, to Senate estimates processes, to media conferences, to the courts in Indonesia. So there's no utility in me going through that again now at such a critical, difficult time for the uh, diplomatic efforts. So I will answer those questions. I believe we need to answer those questions. We'll answer them again, uh, but now's not the day. No, thank you, sir. Uh, in the middle, thank you. Lady in the middle. Uh, Jane Margetts, ABC. Um, you talked to, uh, about lessons learned, and um, I know that you can't go into detail about the operations of the Bali Nine, but in hindsight, do you think um, that there's anything, could the AFP have done something differently that may have avoided these two men being exposed to the death penalty now? Look, I, I'm just not, I, I'm not going to go into it because to answer one question will take me down a path that is not helpful to the government's efforts. Uh, what I would encourage people to do is look at the history since 2005. Um, we have put a lot of material on the record, including the federal court outcomes when we were challenged about our role. Uh, we have said publicly um, the guidelines we acted on and acted on appropriately then have been amended and reviewed and were re re uh, issued by the government in 2009. If people want to understand that, please go back and, and look at it. I'm not going to add any more voice to that today because the, the, the clemency efforts need to be the priority, are the priority, and the AFP is, is supporting the government in those efforts. Anthony Bubalo at the back. Hi, Anthony Bubalo from the Lowe Institute. Um, the foreign fighter problem represents a challenge on very many levels, but I wanted to focus on two in particular and, and get your views on, on how the AFP is, is responding to this particular challenge. The first is the, that in, in terms of a terrorism problem f for really perhaps the first time, the significant number of Australian nationals involved. And secondly, um, the large number of Western passport holders uh, relatively speaking, in, the for in terms of the foreign fighter numbers and what that and, and their ability to move relatively more freely than, than perhaps previous generations of, of uh, uh, international terrorists. Yeah, look, thanks, Anthony. I think you summed up in, in a couple of questions the challenge that we have. Uh, when I think about where we, where we are now, and, and people who know my history will know that I was heavily involved with CT in the you know, counterterrorism in the frameworks um, immediately after September 11 and the Bali bombings. The threat is different now. Uh, largely then it was an external threat, and when it was an internal threat, such as the operations you saw in Melbourne and Sydney around Pendennis and Neath, we were dealing with a confined core that we could, we could take action against. The threat's different now, and it's been externalised, but it is now becoming uh, a domestic <coughs> issue. And what we, what we are seeing is people who are moving very quickly from thought to intent, 
to action without opportunities for law enforcement and security agencies to pick it up earlier. Uh, so that's, that's the nature of how the problem has changed. How are we reacting to that? We're doing what we have to do um, to work with our partners, first and foremost, and I want to reassure the community again that in this country you have agencies that work very well together, but one of the most important parts of it, and, and we talk to the community all the time, is, is the communities. And I'm not just talking about individual communities, I'm talking about the community as a whole, uh, working with law enforcement to, uh, to try and you know, help us understand the dynamic that we're dealing with. In terms of that broader question around uh, the flow of foreigners, I think you know, there's various figures being quoted about how many Western countries, for instance, are involved in the IS uh, flight, uh, flight in Syria and northern Iraq, and you, you, know, you hear all sorts of figures around 3,000. Um, that does present challenges. It's a, it's a difficult policy problem for the government, and there's a lot of discussion, a lot of thought about, as, as the Prime Minister has said, about citizenship, about passports, about removing passports. We have international obligations not to export Australians to be involved in terrorism. Likewise, we have obligations to make sure that Australians are safe back home. So, you know, we are, we are um, keeping the public very well informed. The Prime Minister is certainly on the front foot about letting the public know what our policy settings are and our thinking, but it's a difficult challenge. Can I ask you on that, how important is the Australian Muslim community as an ally in the, um, the, the fight to prevent radicalisation? Well, look, they're, they're fundamentally important, but what I want to be careful too is I don't want it to be all about the Australian Muslim community. And I think they uh, often understandably feel targeted, um, targeted because we want to work with them, targeted because they're seen as being uh, in some way involved in the, in, in the issues, and they're not. I mean, the Australian Muslim po population are incredibly supportive of what we do. Um, from an AFP perspective, we have good outreach and we meet with them a lot. We could not achieve the success we have in stopping attacks in this country without them. But equally, we need the whole community engaged. This can't be about one part of the community uh, and all the focus being on them. I feel greatly for members of the Australian Muslim community whose children are targeted on buses on the way to school, uh, who are afraid to go to work or are afraid for their wives or partners to do the shopping. I mean, that's a really terrible indictment on this country mm. and society. And I don't think that's, a, that's not an Australia that any of us actually support. What did you think as a matter of interest? You, you talked about the, the response of Sydney siders and Australians to the Link Cafe siege. What did you think about the I'll ride with you phenomenon that developed on Twitter? Yeah, it, it was interesting. I mean, the, the, it, it grew very quickly and it grew from a good place. My sense is it grew from a good place. It, it, it was distorted and misused by some people um, and people who wanted to interpret it as someone um, rising for a fight, for instance, interpreted that way, but at its core, I saw it coming from a good place. And I think it reflected what happened in Martin Place insofar as the outpouring of support and the outpouring of this isn't an issue for Islam, this isn't an is issue for the Muslim community, this is about criminals doing terrible deeds. Thank you. The gentleman on the end. Uh, Thomas Lonigan, Commissioner. Uh, the recent uh, McKinnon CT review recommended the appointment of a national CT coordinator and proffered three options for government to consider. Uh, the Director General of Security or a senior public servant in either the Attorney General's Department or PMNC. I'm just wondering if I could gauge your view on why wasn't a senior police officer considered appropriate for that position, given the high threat you've mentioned and the very operational nature of today's problem? Um, I guess I'll, I'll be careful how I answer that because that's a current policy consideration and government's working through uh, how it wants to respond to that and, and what the ultimate construct of the CT coordinator would look like. But um, I don't quite agree with your premise that a senior police officer hasn't been considered for that role. It, it's open. Uh, it's certainly the uh, Director General of ASIO has been no nominated by some um, journalists as an obvious person and others have said it's the wrong person. That's still something that the government's working through and from my perspective, I think a senior police officer should be in that mix because at the end of the day, um, the, the, the front for this issue is dealt with by police around this country. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Paul Maley from the Australian newspaper. Uh, you spoke a little bit about the, um, uh, the fact that the AFP is actively involved in the, the whole of government approach uh, aimed at sparing the lives of these two Australians. Can you just tell us specifically what the AFP is doing or has done 
uh, in terms of, of uh, persuading the Indonesians to grant them clemency, whether or not the AFP has made direct representations, engaged in its own sort of, as you call it, police diplomacy. Yeah. Um, I ask that knowing that the AFP has traditionally been very well regarded up in Indonesia and uh, I would assume is, is attempting to leverage that uh, goodwill. Yeah, no, we are. Thanks, Paul. Uh, look, we've been careful not to go into the nuts and bolts of everything that's been done by government. Um, there's been a lot, a considerable amount done. From the AFP's perspective, I think the attorney may even have mentioned it yesterday in Parliament, uh, that you know I've written to my counterpart uh, along very similar lines asking for the Indonesian government to consider clemency and to look at the facts and circumstances. Of course, people forget that... Uh, Former Commissioner Mick Kelty and my Deputy Commissioner, my now Deputy Commissioner Mike Phelan, actually went and gave evidence on behalf of some of the Bali Nine in courts in Indonesia. Uh, I think that's kind of been forgotten in the process. But the other key part, Paul, of what you say is there is that police-led diplomacy. We do have good relationships and we do have influence, and we have, uh, where possible, we are using that influence uh, through those softer diplomacy skills to try and uh, bring about a different outcome. Uh, yes, I'll go to Aaron Connolly and then this gentleman. Thank you, Commissioner. Aaron Connolly from the Lowy Institute. I understand you've addressed the Bali 9 issue, and I want to set that aside. Uh, but cooperation with the Indonesian National Police must be very important to you, but also very challenging, given that this is an organization whose chief and vice chief are embroiled in very serious uh, and very credible corruption allegations, and uh, against which there have been accusations of involvement in both drug trafficking and people smuggling. How do you make sure, as a general principle, in your cooperation with partner agencies overseas, that AFP assistance uh, and cooperation doesn't lead to involvement uh, in things that you wouldn't want to be involved in? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess the first thing I'd say is that the KPK, who is the anti-corruption body in Indonesia, is also a partner of the AFP, and we work very closely with them. And some of the more recent reports about their, um, their findings and their view of the uh, Kapolri, the, the commissioner-elect, um, have been widely reported. Uh, it's a good question because uh, it's, it is a challenge. It's difficult. We need to and we have to work with Indonesia and uh, the local authorities and we have a great relationship with them. But my officers know absolutely that integrity is the number one foundation upon which police forces are built. And largely, uh, that's not an issue for the way that we go about doing business. Um, it, it, it doesn't become... A, it doesn't become something that inhibits what we do. To the extent that any of my officers did see actions or activities that they thought breached what we would consider our core values, uh, particularly around integrity and corruption, uh, they know how to deal with it, they know how to report it, and they know how to disengage. And that's what I expect of them. The gentleman in the corner. Uh, Michael Safi from The Guardian. Uh, Commissioner, given the number of Australians fighting in Iraq and Syria, uh, has the AFP investigated the possibility of of liaising with sort of uh, what the people describe as disillusioned foreign fighters with the possibility of bringing them back to Australia? And if not, do you think that that's a possibility that they'll have to look into at some point in the future, given the sheer number of, of Australians who are fighting over there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been reported already that there are Australians who've returned from the conflict zone. Uh, and I don't want to add too much speculation to numbers. I know it's been, it's been talked about. Um, between ourselves and the security partners... We're very conscious of, of engaging those people and working with them where they want to work with us. I mean, they need to want to work with, with um, police or security agencies in the first place. The broader question, though, is those that are currently fighting, if and when they might wish to come back, and that's something that's started to be played out in the media. Um, it's a very active policy consideration at the moment. I, I don't want to um, reveal what the policy is here and now, but it is something that we're very seized of. And it's going to involve a range of treatments. Now, the Prime Minister has said, and I recall standing with him when he said uh, in Melbourne when we raised the threat level, that uh, the Australian community needs to be protected. And we need to ensure that if individuals come back into Australia, um, because they're Australian citizens, uh, that we can be assured of the safety of the community. And that's our number one priority. There's a range of ways that we can deal with that. And I'm very interested in engaging with these individuals where they want to talk to us. Lady at the back in the blue dress. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, you've spoken today very broadly about capabilities and involvement. Given that, what boundaries or constraints, if any, does your status as a police force put around your involvement in discussions and decisions of national interest? Um, 
Okay, if I understand your question right, there are there's a lot of there's a lot of restrictions on police agencies, probably more so in this country than any country, about how we use technology and what could be defined as being in the national interest. So, if I take your question to be that that infringement upon civil liberties and freedoms, is that what you? Yeah, look, there, there are very there's tight legislation around what we do. So, everything that I want to do in the capability space, and as I said in the speech, it's you know, there are tools, toys, if you like that um, are very technically advanced that allow us to do things that people may consider to be invasions of privacy and intrusion. Um, you know, we haven't even touched on the current metadata debate, um, but you know, that's, a, that's a hot debate and it should be a discussion in the community, no question. But law enforcement agencies in this country have very tight laws that dictate how we do it. My, um, my focus is around those softer capabilities though. I want my police to, um, to have behind them the specialisation that they need to get the job done because it is an increasingly complex world. Now, I can only talk from my experience as a, from 25 years in the, in the AFP, that uh, you know, the statute books when I was a young investigator ran to about that thick. Now they'd fill this wall. Um, you know, that what was quite simple legislation then is now incredibly complex legislation balancing the needs to protect civil liberties and rights with the need to protect the community and, and to uh, enforce the laws. So we have tight parameters on that. What I want is my capabilities for my police officers to have the skills and expertise to deal with that the way that I expect them to. Andrew, can I ask you a question on a different topic? Um, in the mid noughties uh, at the time of the deployment to the Solomon Islands, the international deployment group of the AFP was really a very significant part of your operations. And that was an amazing uh, operation in the sense that it was a police-led intervention. The military was involved, there was a warship or two standing off, offshore, there were some soldiers there, but it was, it was very much police-led. And I think most analysts would say that the first couple of years of that operation were very successful. I think then uh, analysts sort of part ways on how much lasting change was delivered to the Solomons by the whole Ramsey effort. But in terms of the, uh, the initial stabilisation operation, I think it was very successful. Can I ask you, what lessons has AFP learned from uh, Ramsey? And can you foresee uh, a time again in, the near, in, in your term, perhaps as Commissioner, when um, that kind of police-led intervention may be called upon again? Yeah, look, I think those police-led interventions are, are critically important. We see all around the world interventions that are military-led and they're successful and they do a lot of good to build immediate peace and stability. But my interest is what's the long term? What happens after that? Uh, how do you build societies? How do you build rule of law to make sure that a society can function for the longer term? Ramsey is a good example. And there's a lot of different views about whether Ramsey's been successful or not. Uh, none of those will actually be able, we'll never know who's right, who's wrong, until the point that Australia completely pulls out of the Solomon Islands and says, over to you, um, you know, PM Sogavare or whoever, uh, and we see how it goes. But there's been indicators along the way, and the most recent one was the election held at the end of last year, that, uh, again, this is an AFP view, it's mostly independent observers, was a fair and free election. There's always going to be challenges, but largely fair and free, and from my perspective, was done in a peaceful, stable, secure environment. That's a long way from, say, 2006 elections, where there were lots of problems. So they're indicators of progress, and, and along that path, the military pulled out and it's transitioned from peace and stabilisation to capacity building by police. I think that that's a model that can work not just in bilateral interventions, but in UN interventions as well. And we've learnt lessons from Timor-Leste where there was a couple of different starts after the 1999 intervention and then the 2006 intervention where the UN learnt and we learnt you know, there really is there, is there a lot of value in having 36 different countries trying to teach the um, local police force how to police. Maybe we need to have it, you know, a handful of countries. So I think there's a lot of lessons there. I believe that uh, there's no point having peace and stabilisation unless there's something that comes after, and that's often police. We've got time probably for one more question. If there's another hand in the air. I'll go to the gentleman at the back as you had a question, Paul. Thank you for your talk, Commissioner. But you made no mention of your relationship with the state police forces, which I would think is highly important. Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. I don't, thank you. 
Um, I don't want anything I've said, and there's a couple of my colleagues from the State Police in the room. There's nothing I, that I have said today that should be interpreted as, um, as not wanting to work with the State Police, quite the opposite. Uh, today was probably more looking externally to Australia, uh, not internally. Uh, our relationship with the State and Territory Police is very good. I, I, don't, I know you'd expect me to say that, but I'm not just saying that. I've been in the organisation for long enough and in the national side of what we do where from day one I've been working with State and Territory colleagues. We enjoy a better relationship now than I believe we have at any time in our history. Um, of course, uh, it's always going to be uh, fraught with uh, issues and concerns, but that's the wonderful nature of federation in this country and the way that we're constructed. Uh, what's important, and there's very little, if you look at the success of the AFP, all of it has been with our partners. So the success of the counter-terrorism teams, they are joint counter-terrorism teams with, with state and Commonwealth partners. If you look at the success of the national anti-gang squads that were stood up over the last 18 months, they have been stood up with our partners around the country. You look at the success of our child exploitation task forces, they are joint task forces. The work we do at the waterfront are joint task forces, understanding vulnerabilities. So it's, it's homogenous, it's, it's seamless. Uh, we work very well with our state and territory colleagues. Um, that's the question of the value add that I want to ask. What, is, what value are we constantly bringing to the equation? Because I only have 6,500 employees. Andrew Scipioni has close on 20,000. Um, you know, uh, Tim Cartwright in Victoria has 16,000, 17,000. So if we're not bringing something of value to the table, then there's probably not a lot of reason for us to be at the table. At the moment, we bring a lot of value. He looked a little bit envious when he said Andrew Scipioni has 20,000 employees. Lady, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we've, we've been very lucky to hear from the Commissioner today. Um, when I met Andrew eight years ago, he was very young for the job that he was doing as Chief of Staff to the Commissioner of the AFP. Now he's very young to be a Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police. But the reason that Andrew has always been uh, picked out, in my opinion, and has always stood out uh, among the ranks is for his ability and his breadth and his integrity as a person. And I think you've seen some of that integrity and breadth today in the way that he has answered questions on really every aspect of um, his work. So Andrew, uh, I'm sorry that it took eight years um, to get a Commissioner of the AF AFP here and three Commissioners, but we're very glad indeed that you joined us. So please join me in thanking Commissioner Colvin. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, thank you too also for coming. Let me remind you the next event of the Institute next Tuesday will be on a topic that Andrew touched on, and that is the question of uh, Islamist terrorism. And in particular, we have a discussion on Indonesia and Islamic State, which will be led by the very well-known international expert, Sidney Jones. That's on next Tuesday afternoon, I believe. So if you're interested, please go on the website and come along. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks,